do a good turn and be prepared. Be prepared is to always be ready. So this is something as, as a 11 year old kid that I learned by the uniform, uh, going outdoors and trying, can you see? All right. So where we can, you know, be prepared for any circumstance. So that's where I learned these uh, uh, first things of my life, wearing the uniform, being in a, in a community of, of uh, young children, being outdoor. And that led to me joining the National Defense Academy. National Defense Academy, and if you're visiting, apart from, of course, girl generation may be mad because AFMC is in Pune. Okay, National Defense Academy is in Pune. And uh, it's a three-year tenure uh, training that we have there. Mm -hmm. And the motto of the National Defense Academy, which incidentally is celebrating 75 years, is service before seven. And day in and day out, we are asked to tell a prayer where we are asked to put service before seven. And, uh, you know, uh, pray to God to give us better opportunities and new opportunities to serve in Europe. And uh, the most important thing that I learned about uh, in the National Defense Academy, apart from the military training and the academy training is camaraderie. It's very, very important. You can see a picture here. Uh, the training is very hard, but what you build is lifelong friends. They're much more important than your blood relatives and your partners in your life. It's friends and forums like this where you build friendships. I think this will go a long way rather than your own blood relatives and your. Uh, so this is my the way that I learned camaraderie. And maybe that's the reason why I'm here today because uh, we are are connected by a particular uh, hostel that we had in the National Defense Academy and because of which he uh, today said, why don't we come and talk to our forum? And I was uh, very happy to come and share my learnings and how I uh, uh, lead to people and then how I grow it. All right. So from National Defense Academy, uh, one of the lessons that I learned, which I thought would be also useful in your businesses as well as in your personal life, is because we are in a hostel scenario and resources are very Less is also will be in your uh, business environment. Resources are always less. And the only resource which nobody can else give you is time. You can get money, you can get funding, you can get everything else. You can get manpower, but you won't get time. 24 hours the same for a lawyer, a vastu exponent, or an image consultant, or anyone else who's here, or a radiologist. You, know. you can get, I mean, from two years, you've got your own facility, everything. But time, 24 hours, everybody's got to see. So how do you maximize that? This is what I learned in the National Defense Academy. So one of my seniors taught me that five minutes early at the beginning of the day, you'll be five minutes early at the end. So this morning, I got up five minutes early, said, okay, let me be early to this meeting so that I'm ready for everything. And I want a train to catch, go somewhere, then take another mode of transport. So I hope I'll be five minutes early at the end. But whereas on the flip side, if you're five minutes late at the beginning of the day, everything is going to, you know, accumulate and you'll be one hour late at the end. And this happens in a training academy, in a hostel scenario. You'll forget something, you'll forget your cell phone, you'll uh, put your car into a low parking area and things like that will just accumulate. And so this is something that I learned at the National Defense Academy, which I think would be very useful uh, in your businesses, especially for, of course, your own leaders, but for your team members that you tell them that time is the most important resource and how to maximize, uh, how to use this time. This learning is from my National Defense Academy. And then I moved on uh, to greater learnings. I, as a young officer, was posted to Jammu and Kashmir. I got commissioned in 1997. And in 1998, I was posted in the lovely, this lovely place in Jammu and Kashmir. It looks very serene. Uh, this is at 10,000 feet. This is a place in Kupwada, a place called Boat Pounders. Uh, I just had about a year of service and I was right into the action. And between the 1st and 3rd of July 1998, um, uh, I participated in an action where I led some troops, which uh, which I will explain, where I was uh, <coughs> in this place called Bungus and we got some information about some militants who had crossed over from across, who had come into our area of responsibility. And we didn't know how many of them were there and uh, what were they carrying. But I was a young officer and I was told that Make sure that uh, they are not get into the hinterland and whatever it takes, even if you have to eliminate them. So I uh, divided my team, like all of you would have teams, where uh, I had to see who's right for the right thing. And I took the toughest uh, place to go, which was a good but not fast, that's 30,400 feet. And I said, this is the place that I should position myself just in case these uh, militants or terrorists cross. And as leaders, I think um, this is something learning that I can pass on to you. If there's a difficult task, like they've been teaching us in the army, is to lead from the front. 
always take the difficult tasks upon you and your team will always look up to you. You don't have to go through management lessons. If you are a leader of a team, do the things that are more difficult and do it yourself. Automatically, people will follow you. And that's what I did. I go to went to Gurmatna Pass. On the first, nothing happened. It was a rainy day. On the second, there was a, uh, you know, uh, we did a search operation. Nothing would fall. Another party uh, found some terrorists and they eliminated two of them and one of them escaped. And we were tasked to, you know, go and find out who the one escaped person was. Whole day, we had no food on the first. The second, there was no food. And the whole day, we were searching for this escaped militant. We couldn't find. And we were all tired. And on the second night, we all went back to Gurmat Pass. Again, got into a position, what we call as an ambush, where we will look for people crossing. And sure enough, on third morning at about four o'clock, uh, we spotted some terrorists across, maybe at about uh, 100 yards away. Uh, but this was at uh, four o'clock in the morning. But there was no daylight. We had seen through our night vision and goggles. So I took a decision that, yes, uh, I need to uh, make sure that these uh, militants are either eliminated or surrendered, whatever it is. But the time was not right because it was dark and we were all tired. So that's where, again, as uh, something that I learned in the army is how confident you are about your skills, about the men you lead, about the way where you're operating. You know, uh, Mama talk, uh, talked about her skills about radiology and how she's put it out and her learnings in the Navy incident. Today is the Navy day, so congratulations to her yes. and to everyone. Uh, uh, the Indian Navy is doing a great job. So uh, I was very confident of my uh, troops. I was confident of the area that I was operating on. And that's the reason why I started the operation much into the daylight, which is well against the teachings that the moment you see it, automatically you engage them and, you know, it's an opportunity. But I was very confident because I prayed with them and I made sure that we started the operation well into daylight at about 6.45, we started training them. And between 8.45 and about 9.45, we engaged them. These blocks that you see on the green are where we work. We were 11 of us, one officer and a GCO who's like the next rank, and then we had 10 soldiers. And we were uh, totally one officer and 11 other people. And we eliminated these uh, militants in a one hour operation. And more importantly, not only we eliminated these militants, but we didn't have a single scratch in any of our books. And that was also more important. We were very, very confident of our. Uh, training, and you can see from the kind of weaponry that the terrorists were carrying, pretty dangerous weaponry. On the right side, you see everybody was having, uh, you know, AK-47s to block the whole place, and, uh, but we were confident of what to do. And I, uh, this was what appeared in the newspaper. 13 of them were eliminated over a period, and the first time that such a large number of uh, terrorists were eliminated. And uh, I attribute this, because like I told you, that the more you sweat in peace, Peace, the less you would be in war. And this was the learning that I got uh, from the National Defense Academy and the Indian Military Academy, that the more you train, whether you are a, you know, a Vastu expert, an architect, or a lawyer, if you have your knowledge and you can train well, when that crisis happens, then you will be ready. And that's what happened when we had the operation. Although they, we were heavily outnumbered in terms of ammunition, in terms of the weaponry and the numbers also, but we were confident because we had trained it hard. We knew our skills, we knew our area, and we knew that we were better than them. And that's the reason uh, why we came, and that's the reason why I was awarded the Sharia Chakra, which is a great uh, award uh, given by the President of India for bravery. But very few people get it to when they're alive, most of them get it when they're posthumous. So I, I credit that to my team and to the learnings that I got. So that's where I learned from. And then, of course, the leaning and growing happened later in my life. Leaning, I got it from uh, my various passions and hobbies. One of the uh, you know uh, hobbies that I have is to meet uh, celebrities and get their autographs. Can you recognize them? Yeah. Can you recognize? <laughs> yes, uh, all these. I'm not talking about the other celebrities. Uh, I'm not talking about the other one. We can just recognize them. <laughs> 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 I'm talking about the other one. <laughs> I'm sure everyone is. All right. And then uh, anyone from South India would know Mohan Lal. And okay, now this is where I try to. Ah, that's that's yeah. nice of you. Yeah, the, uh, common, the, com the common part is you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I took him to Bhutan. Uh, Bhutan is a lovely place and I took him there and he wanted to have a relaxed holiday. I said, this is the best place that you can have. So I took him to Bhutan. And like uh, Ganesh had mentioned, I was posted in Bhutan where 
I learned a lot of things in life. I, I, I learned about how to be happy in life, how to live for the day. And that's what put me is uh, following their own uh, ethos and their this thing. So I took him there. And then, of course, uh, any presentation, God should always be there to bless you. So here is Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, and this is the uh, Virat, who is, you know, the current uh, this thing. Of course, Sindhu has done so much for women in sports, and individual sports, especially uh, an Olympic sport, which is very, very difficult. And of course, football followers, uh, Messi. Wow. Any Messi fans here? Yeah. All right, oh, well, yeah. great. So, next to Ronaldo. All right. But the greatest is here, uh, Pele. And all of these, I have learned uh, uh, many aspects of these celebrities that I meet them. Uh, some I have a uh, great relationship with them over the years. And uh, one of them is uh, MS Dhoni. I met him as a photograph collector uh, way back in 2009. Built a relationship with, over the years. Was there when India won the World Cup. I know I was there that night on 2011. And of course, seeing his uh, you know, capabilities, I also pushed the case so that he can be joining the Indian Army as a Central Rail Army officer. And that's how you know, he became an Army <coughs> officer. And also, it's just not for some brand thing or, or just as a celebrity, but he actively participates in training and he's done a parachute uh, training course in Agra, which many of us, including me, have not done it. Uh, tough training course. So here is one person who I've learned, and one of the learnings that I've got from him, and I always lean up to him to you know take some advice. Always, uh, he's much younger to me, but still he's got so much of uh, experience in life of leading a team, and he also takes a lot of learnings from the army when he wants to uh, talk to people. In fact, recently had injury in his knee, and I've taken him out to a base. He was talking to a lot of soldiers how they deal with this injury, you know, because. We also have to, uh, in spite of the injuries, we have to go on with our day to day work. And that's what did in the present IPL. He had a knee injury, but still he carried on. And many of the learnings he got from the soldiers, from whom I, uh, I take them to a base and spoke to the soldiers, and everybody gave their method of how they deal with these things. And the greatest lesson that I've learned from this is this. And this is not the chai, the CDC chai, that's not this. <laughs> but this is uh, uh, a mantra that he follows in life, which I follow. Till day, it is control the control. Day in and day out, he believes in this mantra of control the control. Where he believes that nothing which is not your control should not be bothered about. And this is very, very true in not only your professional lives, but also your personal lives. If you can control the controllables, the kind of conflicts that you have uh, will completely get free. Uh, that's why maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, lawyers are going to be used always, but, you know, mediation is such a nice way to now get into rather than just having conflicts. So that's control the control with what you can, your resources. Many of the time, uh, things are right out of your hands. You cannot control them. So just leave that. What you can do is what's important. And this is a lesson that I've learned from him. I've leaned into him. I've got this lesson and I practice it. He practices it day in, day out. I practice it whenever it's possible for me. So that's control the controllables. But uh, uh, I wanted to grow in life, you know. And uh, so when I finished my 20 years, like, man, I was eligible for pension. And so I said, okay, there is something that I need to do uh, to uh, actually address the uh, problem, which is actual problem, you know. Uh, so in the army, we have uh, soldiers who died because of operations. They're called battle casualties. People die, you know, uh, in Cargill or any other war or any other operation. Uh, they're the battle casualties. We lose about 100 of them for a National War Memorial. If, if you're not being, you must go to the National War Memorial in Delhi. It's a beautiful place where all these names are written. We've got about uh, 26,000 such uh, soldiers who have died across uh, 77 years of our independence. But also, in the army, we lose about 1,000 500 soldiers every year because of accidents, suicides, medical condition, you know, factory sites. These are called physical casualties. And that's the reason why I uh, embarked on this project. It's a purely philanthropic project. I spend my own money. I travel on my own. It's one man, there's no team. And I dedicated the project to my own postmates because I believe that charity begins at home. Whatever you do, start with your own whether it's your own employees, your own family, and then go and change the world. You know, everybody need not be great at that work. You can start with your own this thing by doing recycling or whatever you want to do. So this is Project Samba, and that's where I wanted to grow. And unfortunately, the color scheme, because I think 
of what we have put in the new computer is there. Otherwise, I'm sure you can read it. It's, it's one man long for the exercise. These are the four reasons for physical casualties. Accidents, medical conditions, suicide, and fratricide, we lose 1,500. Unfortunately, the widows and the family go through huge, huge uh, issues, you know, challenges. Why? Uh, uh, it, it could also be the uh, family in the sense that it could be the wife and the children as well as the elderly parents, you know, who lose their son or now daughter also. So they have three major challenges. Financial, because they get less pension. Uh, the people who die in war or operation, they get 100% pension. That's the last salary is protected for life. Uh, the children's education is taken care of the government, and they should be. But unfortunately, the uh, families of these kind of casualties, uh, they get less pension. They get 30 to 60% pension, which ranges from 9,000 rupees to about 22,000 rupees. Uh, in, in a city, is very, very difficult to survive in such an uh, uh, amount uh, with no housing and things like that. So they have a huge uh, financial uh, problem. And then they have the social issue of being branded as a widow so young in life. You know, at 25, 30, they are branded as a widow of the children, uh, and the challenges of a single mother is so much in India because the way that they're branded as a, a widow, especially in a village environment. So this is another major challenge that they have uh, socially. And then the third challenge is emotion. You know. uh, everybody comes when the man dies, when the soldier dies, the whole society comes, the unit comes, everything comes. But after six months, people are busy and they move on. And, and the people don't realize that the emotional uh, stress that the, uh, uh, the widow or the parents go through at various stages of their life. Initially, of course, the bereavement happens, uh, you know, and then you go and go on to practical stuff. And then, you know, you have your, teen, uh, your children becoming teenagers and then for them to uh, their tantrums. And then once they leave, then the kind of emotion. So there is a need for emotional support, a professional emotional support. And uh, unfortunately, in India, many of the ladies, at least in the village environment, don't have friends. You know? All their friends are their uh, husbands, wives who are their friends. You know, I mean, they are husbands, they are husbands friends, wives who are their friends. Unfortunately, they don't have their own friends. They don't know who to open up. So that's where I'm trying to build up a, a kind of a network for them of, of, of widows who have lost their husbands much earlier, who can talk to the young widows and say that, don't worry, life will go on. You need to build your skills. You need to be more strong. So these are the challenges I'm trying to uh, address. So I travel. I've traveled across India. I've been to more than uh, so many districts, 600 districts uh, over the last uh, six years. And so I'd like to give you a couple of, I think we've got about 10 minutes more. Right. Okay. So we're going to give you a couple of uh, stories that I'll give you. I, I believe that storytelling is the best way that I can convey a point. And that's how I've grown. From each story, I've learned a lot. So I went to this place called Sundarbani. Anyone knows where yeah, Sundarbani yeah. is? Where so Jammu. Sundarbani. Jammu. Not, yeah, Jammu. Jammu. Not to be confused with Sundarbani. Sundarbani. I wanted to <laughs> answer only, but with the Hoji dipped in and said Jammu. <laughs> All right. But I wanted him to say, oh, the tiger reserve. No, <laughs> I, I, I'm aware. Uh, okay, but Sundarbani is a small place with a lot of punch, with a lot of uh, yeah. fighting happened. It's a small place. So I'd gone, uh, given a talk like this, and spoken to this thing. And I said, okay, I had a, I have a database that I've compiled over the last six years. So I'd go to 27,000 such, uh, you know. And so I went, went there. I spoke to the lady and I said, you know, I want to meet you. I want to uh, help you with uh, what are the processes and things. And she said, I've got really 10 minutes. I've got to go to school. My child has got to the school, 10 minutes come to this uh, tea shop. So I went up, went and met her. She said, I lost my husband just two years in the marriage. Uh, he had some issues with his stomach. I had a one-year-old girl, and uh, that's why I'm here. I'm, I've survived. I've started. I, I, I skilled myself, became a teacher, and that's all. So a young girl, so the funny, small girl. I said, I'm going to that. I'm not going to go to class. I'm going to go to the I'm in ninth standard. I want to be a cardiologist. I got taken aback that in a small place like Sundarbani, here is a confident girl which speaks good English and is very clear on what she wants. I said, that's that's for the people that I want to help out. And of course, the government schemes, whatever forms that I mean, most of them are not aware. I helped them with that, but that's very paltry. But I knew that she had a spot. So I reached out to my friends, uh, through social media and things like that. And I knew in 10 standards, she got 484 out of 500. Um, we knew that she had the potential, but Sundarbani is not the place, so we had to shift her to Jammu. Somebody helped me, uh, you know, getting an accommodation for her in Jammu. Somebody donated a laptop. Somebody said, we need to go through meet coaching, so somebody sponsored that. So that's how the society helps you. Uh, the more you uh, 
give, uh, then you can take a loan. So I had gone and done all that. A lot of people were giving, and she then did a well standard. And you can see that she got 492 out of 500 in the world. That's the kind of potential she had. So that if you give a little push, there are people who are willing to do excellent. And we shifted to this is a picture from Jammu. She wrote her knee. And also because uh, she was a daughter of a soldier who had died. And now she's in the second year of her uh, you know, medical training in Jammu. So this is a success story because one and once one went and met. This girl. If I had not met, just written a letter or just sent a form, she would have got 10,000 rupees from the government. But because when I met her, I found that she had the potential. And that's the power of meeting and someone. Someone is to connect. The more you meet, like you all are doing twice a week, or sometimes physically, sometimes physically, the more you meet, the more you connect, the more you all of you gain. So this is uh, another story is, you know, meeting these people is a big, big challenge. Especially with the ladies, you know, many of them open up to other ladies rather than to, you know, coming in. They think I'm an officer who's come from the government. They say, if there's our you know, people start crying and abusing you. I've learned abuse in all languages, you know, <laughs> because they, they abuse you. They, they're very angry that nobody has come to them to help them out. And they think I'm the government official who's come. And uh, when they tell them, no, I'm not the one, then they start crying and tell them what they're situated. So generally, I, I, I like to take ladies along with me. Because of language, because of the way they open up. So one of those ladies the, of, of the extreme right of the screen, uh, when we went, she was carrying out an art class in the house. So we said, what are you doing? She said, no, with a pension of 40,000 rupees, with two children and my old widowed mother, it's very difficult to stay in rent it out. Incidentally, people don't give out rent to single uh, you know, mothers. It's very, very difficult to give single mothers. It's a taboo to give rent to people. So you have to, if many of them lie, they have they put a you know bindi and say my husband is working in Dubai or someplace. All of them were exposed during the uh, corona. You know, said Dubai, everybody's come back and where's your husband? So things like that. So uh, so we knew she had a potential of some art. And this lady in, in black, she said, you know, my daughter runs a makeup uh, uh, institute. I mean, she's a top makeup uh, professional in Chennai, and uh, maybe uh, we can see if we can give you a training. Uh, she said, but unfortunately, it's one and a half lakh rupees. For 21 4, 21 day goes, plus a lack of rupees on uh, items. But let me see if she can give some discount. She went back to her doctor. The doctor said, What discount? We will do it free for her. And uh, that's what she did. Uh, uh, 21 days ago, she did in Chennai. She traveled about 12 odd kilometers every day for 21 days with two children studying. And at the end of the 21 days, she got the certification. She was done completely uh, you know, free by that lady, this girl, uh, Akriti. And today, Shamla, that lady, earns per you know exposure more than 50,000, 60,000 rupees. She stays in top end resorts. They go for destination wedding. And from makeup, she's gone into hair and things like that. She slowly made inroads into you know the Tamil film industry. Uh, and now she's also tying saris. You know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a huge business of people tying saris, especially the traditional Indian South Indian sari. Uh, so that's how she's become such a confident uh, lady now. She rides a scooter and she says, uh, Sir, please tell me if I need to advise someone from someone who was uh, really bad emotionally to a very confident lady because it's very important to steal them. Money, anyone can You can write a check, one lakh rupees, one crore rupees is good. But if you can guide them, skill them, and you know, show them the way, because if the husband was alive, he would have made sure that you know, things were uh, husband or spouse. You know, maybe I was women who were dying. Uh, it's not only for the soldiers, it's also for officers. Uh, but people forget them. Uh, we think that, you know, it's always that, oh, everybody's celebrated. Unfortunately, what you see is only the battle casualties. You see Murtis and things like that. But then you also lose people because of accidents and things like that. So all this, what I've learned and what I've grown is you need to listen. You need to listen well. You need to lead well. If you're a leader, you need to listen. Listen to, uh, if it could be listening to an equipment, it could be listening to people, it could be listening to the environment, listening to the climate, but listen. Listening is a very, very important uh, skill uh, to lead well. And that's what I've learned uh, uh, to help me grow myself as a person. I always listen to people before I can even tell them because they will come up with things. And uh, the, this is the prime minister listening to me when I'm trying to tell him what is what. And uh, no wonder he's been leading. And I, I mean, at least he's trying to do what he can. And I was trying to explain to him uh, what is important. I also tried to tell 
uh, about another office or what he's doing. <clears throat> but my greatest inspiration has been from uh, this gentleman. I hope you recognize him. Uh, uh, across, he's, he's, he's dead for so many years, but still when I go to uh, schools in, uh, you know, across India, and I conduct quizzes, and I talk about this gentleman, everybody knows that he's one of my inspirations. Uh, I mean, in my best inspiration in my life, I've interacted with him. And my first interaction with him was very, very unique, which I want to share with you, that how a passion can take you where it has to take you. So I was in Delhi. I was uh, called for a professional interview uh, to be selected to go uh, to a foreign mission, uh, Bhutan. And uh, so I came from somewhere in the Northeast. Uh, it's a uni it, it, uh, I went to uniform and I finished at about 5.30 in uh, Sena Bhavan, which is, you know, uh, South Block, <laughs> Sena Bhavan. So 5.30, I, I drove my Marti 800 out. I saw the Indian flag on top of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. I said, oh, great, the president is in town. Because if, if the Indian flag is flying on top of Rashtrapati Bhavan, that means the president is in Delhi. I said, let me go and say hello to him. Um, drove up the Marti 800 to the first check post, which is like, you know, outside some five kilometers outside the Rashtrapati Bhavan, where a Delhi police guy says, the house up, I was in uniform, I said, okay, Rashtrapati is in Delhi. I said, I'm Captain Shankar. So, kya hua? Captain Shankar, kya apka koi appointment? I said, no, Rashtrapati is our Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. So, he's my boss, ke, boss, ke, boss, ke, boss, ke, boss, hai. so, I want to meet him. He got a little, uh, you know, put up for my confidence and things like that. He said, he can't tell us about under jacket. I go inside, there is this uh, CISF and CRPF, which is, you know, also looking up the security. Um, so I, they asked me the same question, do they have an appointment, who are you? I said, I'm Captain Shankar, I'm from the Indian Army, thinking I'm the, I'm, I'm the lord of everything, you know. <laughs> he also got, you know, he didn't know what, what to respond, because nobody has ever asked him a question that just somebody walks in and says, I want to be in the prison. So he, they took me to the reception. And the reception, there are people who have met enough people like me. And they said, no, 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 no chance. There's no chance. But every day the prison appointment is, you know, minute by minute, there's a booklet is given, uh, there's protocol, all six, there's a background verification which has happened. They said, you must be crazy. I said, no, I like to speak to the ADC there. So ADC is some officers who are associated with the prison. I called one of them and I said, you know, uh, you know what, I'm Captain Shankar, I've come from the Northeast, I want to be in the prison. He said, you must be crazy, you know, just, I mean, not only you will get into trouble, I will also get into trouble if you use my name. I said, uh, but since you have taken so much of effort, I will show you around Rashtrapati, you know, if that's what you want. I said, that's not my aim, but still, if you're making the offer, why not? So I said, okay, do me right, okay. So I waited for about 45 minutes, these were all pre cell phone days, you know, I kept waiting, nothing happened. Again, I called him up, he said, you know what, I'm still busy, the Rashtrapati is sitting in the office, and, uh, uh, I can't come out, but what you do is I'll make a pass for you. You go to my room and sit down. And uh, once you finish, maybe in 10, 15 minutes, I'll come. So they made a pass. So one more layer, I've come closer. I went uh, to go to his room. I had to cross this ADC's office, who was a captain equivalent in the Air Force. And um, he said, you know, what's in the office? Because the president is going to leave. I'll just see him off and then come and take you to bed. I said, good enough. Sitting in the ADC's office is good enough. I'll get a cup of tea also. And I kept waiting, and suddenly the president called this ADC for some point. It's just a door away. And suddenly somebody came running to me. He said, Sir, I'm the uh, <laughs> What did he know? <laughs> I went in, and your president was sitting in the office. The ADC was standing, and I went and met him, and I said, Sir, I'm Captain Shankar. I've come from Agartala. He said, Great. Uh, I heard that uh, you've come all the way to meet me. I said, Sir, but how do you know? He said, No, I could hear you talk in the near. This thing. So I asked the ADC, who is this officer who is talking? Uh, who is this person who's got such a loud voice? <laughs> and uh, then the ADC explained to me that here's a crazy guy who has you know, uh, broken everything and come to my office. He said, okay, call him. <laughs> Abdul Kalam being Abdul Kalam said, call him. And when I met him, then he discovered I'm from Tamil Nadu. We started speaking to Tamil. And uh, he told the ADC, no, he's our guest now. You take him around Mughal Gardens and things like that. So I, from somebody who was an intruder, I became a guest, <laughs> you know. And I said, actually, my main motive is to meet you, of course, but I also want some autographs. So he says, you know, I don't sign autographs for adults. I only sign for children. But you have made so much of efforts that I'm going to sign an autograph for you. Go the ADC, you get that card. And this is the card that he gave me. And he asked me to read the card, which is very, very important for all of you two ones. That learning gives creativity. Creativity leads to thinking. 
Thinking provides you knowledge, and knowledge makes you think. And that's what he signed for me, dear Captain Shankar, on 26th of March 2004, unforgettable date in my life. And he signed it APG Abdul Kalam with my rank, with my date, everything. And this lesson that I've learned uh, from Abdul Kalam uh, helped me grow as a person because I believe that knowledge will take you everywhere. You need not be uh, fancy looking or wearing fancy clothes, but knowledge will take you everywhere. And I have always believed in that. Both Colonel Janesh and I have been in a particular uh, you know, a, a section of the army where we believe that knowledge is where will help you win wars. So it's very important for uh, every one of us if you're knowledgeable. How do you get that? You have to learn everything. You have to be creative, you have to think, and that's the work we get And that's what the great man told me. And I always uh, believe that uh, this is a great learning for me. This is my uh, this thing that I circulate to you. My name is Colonel Vemur Shankar. Project Summon is what I do. It keeps me occupied for 50, 20 days because I spend my own money. I have a financial limit when I travel across. And uh, my email address and my telephone numbers are there. But before I go, I need to show you some magic. Wow. So, <laughs> I don't know whether Mr. Sankar would be able to see me or not, but I'm sure the people here would uh, see me. So, I have this bag here and an uh, empty bag, but I've got some three ribbons. All right, so we'll have the two guests here today. Who are the two guests? One is. Okay, Mr. Yash. And, Yash. Yash. and, and uh, yeah, please come here. And uh, so, we've got three ribbons. You want to choose one? Which one? You've chosen the green, which is for prosperity. You've chosen saffron, which is for everything good. And uh, let me get some lady here. Ma'am, please. Ladies. We'll have white. <laughs> okay. Purity. For purity. All right? And an empty bag. Do these three <laughs> colors have any significance? Yes, the national, <laughs> national flag colors. <laughs> what is the significance? National flag. National flag. But individually, they have any significance? No. Not, right? Similarly, in reciprocity, <laughs> as well as in your organization. Individuals need to come together to have something. She could have just been who she was, but she founded this so that all of you can come together, so that all of you can have some purpose in your own profession as well as each other's profession. The okay. more you give, the more you can take. All right? So individually, they'll have nothing, but together they can have something, right? So to do together, I need to put them in the right order. So you can see that your close by is empty. They might think there is some secret trap. <laughs> so I'll put this orange. I'll put the white or saffron, white and green. Uh, it just means specific like. All right. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. All right. So, and these three, if I put it, but you need to do the magical, right? Yeah. Like the reciprocity, magical words you'll have, like learn, lean, and grow. You need to have a magical. What are the magical words? I didn't say Bharat. Yes. But at the same time, the same tone that I said. All right? Mm -hmm. Jai. 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 Bharat Mata ki. Jai. Bharat Mata ki. Jai. Bharat Mata ki. Jai. Jai. So Jai. this is what is important. So this is what is important. <laughs> Where's my? Uh, <laughs> All right. So, empty flag. And people must be thinking why the flag flutters, right? You'll see flag fluttering everywhere. The flag doesn't flutter because of the wind. It flutters because of the last breath of every soldier who's ever given this life. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity. All right, so I'll Thank you very much. Thanks.
Wonderful. I always wear a pocket scarf, so this is going to be, I'm going to be addressing a uh, group tomorrow. I mean, this evening in Bachinda, I'm traveling to Bachinda right after this. So I'll wear your pockets. Thank, uh, thank you. Have a small request. The next time you need any kind of support for your project, please feel free to reach out to us. We all, and I say this on behalf of everyone, yes, yes, absolutely. we will make sure that we can support them in any and every way. Thank you very much. I mean, even the thought is good enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very important. Thank you. Even extra, every extra minute, we would have learned something. Different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, President uh, Shankar, for uh, raising this occasion and sharing and giving us not only touched, not only moved, but also inspired. And it was just awesome. It was hair raising to hear you speak and you. share. The Sambhan stories, and uh, we are looking forward to the part of the future stories.